Hi, I'm Roy Crown from Revelation Trust and welcome to Gospel Entrepreneurs. In this podcast, I'll be finding out what makes Christian entrepreneurs stand out, where they are in church, business or community. Today, I'm joined by Lionel Wallace, who has just finished his year as High Sheriff of St Albans. Lionel takes his entrepreneurial spirit with him wherever he goes. It is amazing some of the stories that he comes out with and the insights. We had a great chat a few weeks ago about how the gospel has informed the way that he approaches everything he does. So sit back, enjoy this engaging conversation. Lionel, you live in St Albans. Tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Well, first of all, I have to say well, it's really great to, to be with you and to be back with you. So I was born in St Albans, in fact. My parents come from the Caribbean islands of St Kitts and Nevis. I don't know if you've ever been there. But yeah, so I was, I was born in St Albans. I was brought up in St Albans. I went to school uh, in St Albans. I had a wonderful time at school and basically went from school into engineering, aeronautical engineering. You may have heard of the you have an aircraft company and how for Sidley, that sort of thing. Well, we had one in Hatfield, not very far from where I was living, but had a tremendous time there. God really created a real great pathway. And I ended up being an engineer, ended up in a department called Airworthiness. So pretty much most of my life has been involved in what we call certification of airplanes, the design and certification of airplanes. And I do the job of making sure that the aircraft can be approved to carry passengers. We call it certification. And you're a high sheriff. What does that mean? High Sheriff has been around, it's probably the longest sovereign appointment in British history. It's over a thousand years old, maybe up to 1200 even. And uh, every year, Her Majesty on the Sovereign selects 55 currently high sheriffs in England and Wales, one for each county. And so on the 10th of March, uh, 2021, Her Majesty appointed me as high sheriff for Hertfordshire. I had a declaration service. Generally speaking, there's very limited amount of current still legal requirements for the high sheriff to do, official receiving officer and another legal obligation. So high sheriffs tend to think about ways in which they can enhance their community. We have a sort of ceremonial responsibility, oversight of law and order. We're very interested in those things. And in my year as high sheriff, I've chosen to focus on young people. So youth in heart. So that's been my focus. And I have selected three things, three pillars, as I call it, to do as high sheriff in Hertfordshire. One deals with how do we make young people really great citizens because I'm really keen that people do really well at school there's a lot of pressure on young people these days of passing exams but one of the things Roy is you can pass all the exams and still not be a great person right so I think being and investing in young people to make them great leaders is really important so I'm working with uh, Archbishop of York's Youth Trust so Stephen Cottrell and the team up there and trying to bring a program that was started by Archbishop John Sentamy, who's now retired, down to Hertfordshire. And you're a gospel man, and you've always been a gospel man. I mean, I'm sure there was a point where you made that decision and that all kind of had an impact on your life. But you've kind of brought the gospel into everything you do, and you're very entrepreneurial in some of the things you've done around that line, haven't you? Yeah, I'd like to think so. And entrepreneurial in the sense of, you know, problem solution. And, you know, very, very engineers like fixing stuff, right? And designing stuff. So that's, you know, business is really problem solution, I think, at its very basic level. And so I I gave my life to Christ when I was 11. I was going to church since I was born because my family, uh, you know, were going to church. Um, But you know yourself that going to church doesn't make you a believer, right? And doesn't even make you a follower. But I gave my life to Christ when I was 11. And God has really just blessed me, you know, in my life, in my education, in the connections, etc. I think the first business I started was a little tuck shop at home because I saw an opportunity there because I I have seven brothers and four sisters, right? So you've got got a captive market, right, at home. And they're all like watching TV. So I used to go out to the shop, buy some sweets and crisps and all the rest of it and sit in the corner of the TV shop and sell the tuck shop to them. So that was my first business, as it were. And that's what entrepreneurs do. They see a need... And then think, hey, I can do something to meet that need. And you take a risk. It's not really very much more complicated than that. Of course, we embellish it with different things. But that was my first introduction to 
trying to make a profit. You know, I'd buy it for 10p, I'd sell it for 15, and at the end, I'd have a little bit left over. And that was interesting. You know, being from a large family, you have to sort of contribute, as it were, at least I felt to. So I went and did paper round when I was 11. Um, I used to go out before school, etc. You know, my parents, very hardworking people, working class. So I, I went to a, a sweet shop and uh, doing paper round there, and I became the manager, almost, of the sweet shop when I was 12. Wow. <laughs> we wouldn't do that these days, but the owner of the shop used to just leave me, get on with it. I did all the stuff, make all the paper rounds up, fill the shelves, etc. You know, it wouldn't be the sort of thing you, you would encourage people necessarily to do today, but it gave me wow. a tremendous accelerated introduction to business. Most importantly, I think introduction into sort of customer service, because it was the sort of thing where you were sort of serving people, trying to get things right, you have complaints and deal with them. And so I had to kind of deal with complaints, you know, at the age of 12, 13, and try and pacify people. And I remember some people coming in, wanting to have a go, and I wasn't very big, and they'd start talking and I'd smile at them. And you've got an amazing smile. Everybody, you can't see this on radio, but let me tell you, he has an amazing smile. That's very kind of you. Um, and just really quash and, and extend the complaint and the problem. And I learned effectively that was a really important asset to have in creating business. And then I went on to, you know, my education, went on to work, and then I went on to start some businesses. It's a bit of a long story. I started initially sort of like a building company, did some work at the Christian Resource Centre over at Highley at Hoddesdon, uh, hairdressers, and that was a story. I started the hairdressers because one of the barbers I used didn't know how to cut my type of hair. And I'm coming, you know, coming from the African Caribbean community, and I had a hole in my back of my hair. And one thing I promised myself is when I get in enough money i'm going to start my own barber shop <laughs> and although i've never been a barber i did start a really successful barber shop and i had a number of different assets to the business in the company and was learning extremely fast i have to be honest with you boy uh, very fast and in fact i made lots of mistakes and i've learned tremendously more from my failures if i put it that way or as, as people talk about them and my challenges than necessarily I have from my successes. And I'm still doing so today. The things that, you know, you don't really realize that you're doing that doesn't really contribute to business activities. And you've got to learn from that. So I learned from that. And some of those businesses I'm not operating anymore because I focused in more recent times on, you know, aviation lecturing and in the business that I'm currently involved in. And everything you did is kind of, I mean, you could see the entrepreneur as a 12 year old. You can see the entrepreneur before that in the family making a profit uh, your own family seems a bit interesting, Lionel, but uh, hey, I'm, I'm not going to go there. It was a service, right? It was a service. <laughs> I, I was dividing a service. You just, I just want you to emphasize that point, right? Because <laughs> you went and bought it, you walked down the road, so they, they got to pay for that service. I understand that. Absolutely. And gospel has always been in there. And then you went to a church that was kind of... A lot of Italians, so you you thought I need to learn Italian. Give us that storyliner. What happened there? Yeah, so I was brought up in the Seminars of God movement, and one day a group of Italian boys came in and they brought an English person with them who had given his life to Christ. And I became really good friends with, and still good friends with, the son of the pastor of that church. Went around to his house, you know, did all the Italian family thing, lots of pasta. I don't know if you've got any Italian friends, but, you know, <laughs> whenever you go to their house, the food is, you know, it's the first thing on the table, it's fantastic. So I became really good friends with them. And then something happened in, in our fellowship, and I felt God as well at the time calling me to go and serve them. In fact, I was serving the Italian church and playing the piano for them on a Thursday night. The minister said, you couldn't help us out. So I was helping them out on a Thursday night whilst I was still sort of attending my parents' church. And then at this particular point, you know, I felt God pulling me to say, can you go over and serve them because you need them? So I, I joined the Italian church and I started to you know, hang around with them, go to them and pick up words. And then the Lord said to me, if you really love these people, you'll learn their language. And so I started to, you know, find ways of learning through the church. And most of my learning came through the people in the church. There's trial and error. I'd go on holiday to Italy occasionally, and I'd just throw myself in the deep end. And then, you know, I'd get there sometime, and one of the ministers would say, you don't want to preach for us in Italian, do you? Because I was preaching by this time. And I thought to myself, God, I can't preach in Italian. And I remember the very first time that I was asked to do it. And, you know, I was sweating and writing it all out, etc. And then it's like the Holy Spirit came upon me and I just started to speak, the, you know, the message. And I was speaking in Italian. And 
people were saying amen in seemingly the right positions, <laughs> which is quite important. And they got the message. And it was a real lesson to me. And again, this is entrepreneurial because it meant that actually I had to push myself out and be part of a solution that was needed. And there was people there that didn't understand English. And it's one thing I've learned in my ministry is it's okay to have translation. But when you can speak to somebody in their own language and they get it straight away, you know what I mean? And of course, because I'm black, I was like a, a bit of a spectacle up there. There was this, you know, I'd open my mouth and I'd start speaking Italian and everybody would go, <gasps> <laughs> because it just wasn't the case. I mean, now we have a different level of migration in Europe, but at the time, I literally was the only one around. And in fact, they adopted me a bit. They used to call me the black Sicilian. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, and that was, that was I think, because the, the spirit of the Sicilians, they're wonderful people, but also they're, they're the closest to Africa, the Sicilians, I think. <laughs> and as soon as you opened your mouth, it was like, wow, there was so many communication lines that happened that yeah. you had their attention. That, that yeah. amazing. And then yeah. the anointing as well. It was amazing. It was. And, and I think, you know, it's a, it was a God thing. It was a God thing. And I really, you know, and I'm still serving. God has called me to to serve amongst them and I'm still serving and I will until he says something different. And I've really found tremendous blessing myself in being in that community because it's, it's a bit unique, you can probably imagine. Lionel, you keep saying, we keep referencing it right the way through the word serving. You've kind of, each season that you've gone through, you said either find an opportunity to serve by doing a barber's, find an opportunity to serve by getting a sweet shop and serving difficult customers. Just unpack what serving looks like for you and how does an entrepreneur, because some people will say, well, they don't really serve, they're in it to make or to, but actually service is a key for a gospel entrepreneur, isn't it? It totally is, Roy. And I think scripture says, you know, whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord, right? So I think that whether I'm sort of in an airplane and having to interact with people, and some of them, might say they don't even believe in God and they, or they don't have faith. That doesn't change how I deliver to them. So whether that's, you know, in a professional career in engineering or some things I might do in law, et cetera, I consider serving to be giving of yourself and the best of yourself to provide something that enhances somebody else. You know what I mean? And you might get paid for it or you might not. And there's places for both of those. So there's lots of things that I do that are sort of considered voluntary. At least I don't get non-stupendous and I'm a non-stupendous minister. I don't get paid by the church. So uh, voluntary things I'll do. But then it's important, I think, also to serve and get paid for various other things. So, you know, the tent making ministry, we often call it, don't we? So yeah. you, can, you can serve God and you can do lots of things in business as well that help you to be able to give away the time, being practical, to do some other serving. I think for believers, serving in your business is really actually quite important spiritually. And I'm not trying to over-spiritualize it. There are some practical things that you just need to do. You know, you can't buy something for 10 quid and sell it for five and think that everything's going to go okay. It doesn't work. And a lot of people perhaps don't understand that in the church because they feel that actually the serving that the Bible's talking about is holy, you know, you do things for me for nothing. I think that's a misconcept. And I think my latest ministry, which I really enjoy, I don't want to take up too much time, but it is feeding myself as a pastor into lots of young people, particularly, who are starting practical businesses, some of which have, through that connection, given themselves and their life to Christ as well, because that's always a great objective, isn't it? And then God has used me, which I'm really, you know, I just feel so, so honoured by, if I put it that way, and humbled by to speak into their lives things that God promises them based on their faith, based on their ability to stand and say, yes, I will, or to take a step of faith. And I just love it. You know, whether it is in the barber industry, I've got a wonderful young man who's you know, serving God in the barber's industry, that God just spoke a particular words into his life. And he's got a ministry to, you know, the one-to-one -one when he sits somebody in the chair and God can use him to minister into their life. And then there's the other young person who, who is on to, I think, his sixth or seventh cafe shop now. And that started from a conversation about how faith works. I say to people, 
as you know, in Hebrews chapter 11, without faith, it is impossible, not just difficult, it's impossible to please God. So yeah. whatever we want to do that we feel God is inspiring us to do, and we want his engagement with him, you've got to take that step of faith. And then you, you know, be creative as well. And I think in the church, there's a great place for entrepreneurs, Roy. There's a great place for the church developing the thinking for entrepreneurs as well, because the church will be blessed. And right. if people are blessed and they're serving and they're obedient and they're giving, then the church is blessed too. And there's many more things, I think, that the church could do if we had really dedicated entrepreneurs in business that were serving God and seeing God uh, ministering to their life and profiting from it and then obedient in giving back of their time and finances. And there's no escape from that step of faith, is there? I mean, an entrepreneur sees a need, maybe even in social enterprise, there's a particular issue and the need's not being met. There, you know, it could be food, it could be education, it could be something. You actually have to take some steps to see if God's blessing and favour. But if you get an idea, that pretty much is the first step, isn't it? You, you can see something that you can make. That could be different. It doesn't have to be that way. And maybe God has shown this to me to change it. Totally agree. And I think you made an excellent point there because a lot of people are feeling that God's got to send them a first class letter to read for everything that they need to do <laughs> before they take a step. And it isn't like that. God can put a challenge or a problem into your life that you feel you have the solution for and you're the one to do it. And he may not say anything more until you move. And I love the way that, you know, we, particularly in the Old Testament, when you see things like Daniel in the lion's den, all the three Hebrew boys, you see God turn up on the other side of the line. So some people are prepared to go to the line, but God isn't this side of the line. God is the other side of the line. He turns up when you're in the deck, what you thought you would never do. He turns up when you're in the furnace where you hoped you'd never go. And that's one of the great things I learned to be trusting of God, that challenges are not the problem, because God can deal with the challenges and the difficulties if he's leading you. The challenge is, is trusting God in that situation, hearing from him and trusting him in the situation and moving forward and stepping out and then finding that the whole heaven opens for you. Just like the Red Sea, it didn't open before. It only opens at the right time of a faith. And that's for us. And my faith has grown tremendously and my wisdom. And I, you know, I made some mistakes because, you know, I might have said at the time, you know, I think that's God's voice, but sometimes you miss it. You really have to say to yourself, well, actually, maybe, maybe I will miss it a couple of times. Maybe it's just me. And that's okay. And that's okay. You have to focus on and center on the fact that God says he'll never leave me or forsake me. So even if I kind of make a bit of a mistake, God's coming with me on the mistake to bring me back. So that's the comfort I have, Psalm 23 stuff, that although I don't try and make mistakes, I also don't try and achieve total satisfaction and perfection in everything I know before I step. Because that's not how you're doing business. You've got to be prepared to say, yeah, I'm going to try it. I feel there's a problem there, I think, and I'll manage it on the way. I don't know everything about everything. If you knew everything about everything then it wouldn't be faith and it wouldn't be difficult, would it? I think the other thing that's key to this, Lionel, and it's probably where you and I sit now, mm. you also need someone that's gone before that, that can actually cheer you on to say, look, you know, you've got nothing to lose. If God's given it to you, I'm going to cheer you on to have a go. And, and even if it fails, it will give you a great memory. Learn what you need to learn from that and keep moving forward because we are a walk of faith. It is a journey. And what, wouldn't it be terrible to live with the dream still in you or live with those ideas and you never fulfilled it? So that's where you and I are now, Lionel, isn't it? Absolutely catastrophic. The thing that was most impacting in my life spiritually was a practical thing that happened to me. In England, we don't have good weather all the time. So I learned to fly when you can't see out of the aircraft, right? And you learn to fly with a hood on. So you, all you're looking at is the instruments in the cockpit that can tell you whether you're 
climbing, descending, what speed you're doing, whether the aircraft is the right way up or not. Pay attention to that instrument, right? <laughs> I was in the aircraft with an instructor, and he told me to put my hood on. And as we came down to land, normally when I was training, we'd get there about 1,000 feet, and he'd tell me to take my cap off. I'd look up, I'd see the runway, I'd adjust the aircraft so that I was in the centre of the runway and land the aeroplane. And it was fine. This particular day, I went to take the hood off and he tapped my hand, almost rebuked me. And I thought, what's going wrong? And he said, I didn't tell you to take the cap off, leave it on. So now we're descending towards the earth at speed below a thousand feet. And I think landing 10 feet under the runway is going to spoil our day. (laughs) No, I couldn't see, right? And so I'm coming down and I go to 800 feet. And as we get to 800 feet, I sneak a peek under the hood to the other side of the cockpit just to make sure he was still alive because he wasn't saying anything. And now my voice starts changing. I started saying, 700 feet. 600 feet! (laughs) You know, when you've got fear, and this is one of the greatest things that controls people's lives if they allow it to, is fear. And as my voice started to change, the instructor said two words to me. It's three words in Italian, but two words to me. And he was, he was speaking in English. He said, trust me. And as he said those words, the Holy Spirit said to me, Lionel, and that's all I'm ever going to ask you to do. And for the rest of the flight, from 650 feet downwards, he gave me every instruction, the speed to fly, the heading to fly. And all I realized just before we got, he said, pull back gently. I could hear the wheels of the aircraft touch the runway. And when I put the nose of the aircraft right down onto the runway, it was slap bang in the center of the runway. It was the best landing I'd ever done. (laughs) And I realized this boy, like you said, I realized two things. I realized that if I followed the guidance of somebody who was more experienced than me, and I trusted them, I'd probably do okay. But more importantly, I realized that actually he had an interest in us landing this as well. And I think people sometimes forget that God has an interest in your success. (laughs) You know, so so he has an interest in your success. You don't have to fear when he gives you instructions and asks you to go out on a little bit of a limb, if his his voice is leading you, in being entrepreneurial, because he's decided that that's the great thing for you. And that was so monumental in my life that every day when I feel a little bit of fear coming on, it's the thing that pushes it away. What a great story. And you're never going to forget that moment, are you? Like, I'm never, <laughs> ever, never, ever, never, ever. And my instructor said to me, he'd never seen me smile so much. when he got... <laughs> And you've smiled a lot in this interview, so that must have been an amazing smile, Lionel. <laughs> but I think there are those catalytic moments, aren't there, where it's like, okay, you're saying these things, you don't even have to be a God person, but God is taking that and saying, here's the principle, you've been through it. So you were hearing the truth, you were experiencing the truth, and it had a massive impact on the principle for life. Lionel, it's been amazing to chat to you. Uh, As always, we could go on a lot more. You've got a number of initiatives that you're moving forward on. What a joy. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thanks, Lionel, for joining me today. I don't think any of us will ever forget the impact of his flying lesson illustration, coming down, flying blind, trust and fear. This is the last episode of the series. So thanks to all my guests And if you missed any episodes, you can catch them wherever you listen. Thank you for listening today and keep an eye out for more gospel entrepreneurs soon. If you want, it would be great to join me and others on the 11th of May at Moreland's Bible College for an event with Mark Green, Keena Robertshaw and myself to look at the issue of entrepreneurs as well. That's on the 11th of May. Gospel Entrepreneurs is a UCB podcast in partnership with Revelation Trust. It's been great to be with you. God bless.